welcome back for the folks here in person from lunch. Uh, we'll try to keep the energy levels high, knowing how fun the post-lunch afternoon session can be. Um, for folks who are joining us remotely, uh, thank you also for joining us um, as we discuss the topic at hand, which is reconnecting youth to education and employment uh, after involvement in the juvenile justice system. Uh, my name is Stephen Connor. I'm a program director here with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I oversee a portfolio of work related to both our behavioral health and reentry programs. Um, one of which is our Reentry and Employment Strategies Project, which I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, I'm very excited to be joined by our two excellent panelists. Um, Dr. Tim Lasante uh, joins us here from um, New York City. He's worked with the New York City public school system for the past 37 years, where he's been a real leader in alternative education. Um, he's currently the superintendent of District 79, where he has oversight for 11 alternative programs, um, including HSE and GED prep, um, uh, early child care for student parents, career and tech education, um, and residential and youth justice education. Uh, he's also served as a teacher, assistant principal, um, and principal at the schools on Rikers Island. Um, Dr. Lasante is a member of the New York City Juvenile Justice Advisory Board um, and is also an adjunct lecturer teaching graduate courses in special education at Brooklyn College. So thrilled to have him joining us on the panel today. Um, Monica Zeno-Martin is joining us here as the Senior Vice President for um, Program Impact of Youth Build USA. Um, in this role, uh, she is responsible for managing Youth Build USA's technical assistance um, contract from the U.S. Department of Labor and coordinating the delivery of quality and timely services for the youth that are served in that program. Um, she also oversees Youth Build USA's SMART initiative, which is a national multi-year pilot um, which serves court-involved youth through nine Youth Build programs. Um, prior to joining Youth Build USA, Ms. Zeno Martin was Vice President of Employment Services at the Jewish Vocational Service in Boston, so thrilled to have her joining as well. So we will each be uh, presenting on three different topics here today, all related to the topic of education and employment. Um, so we'll be speaking for about 15 minutes each, and then what we're going to do is pause to do Q&A at the end of each of our presentations, just so that questions don't get lost as we go along. Um, so we'll take about 10 minutes for Q&A after each uh, session. For folks in the audience, please do remember to pause and wait until you have a mic in your hand to ask your question. Um, for folks who are joining us remotely, um, you can type in a question in the chat box on the right-hand side um, of your screen, and we can read those questions aloud as they come in and respond to as many as we can with time permitting. So uh, with that, uh, our present, uh, let me uh, kick off with an overview of um, our Integrated Reentry and Employment Strategies project here at the Justice Center um, and talk a little bit about some of the research these sorts of principles um, kind of speaking about how these uh, research principles are applied from a programmatic perspective um, so uh, our work on reentry employment strategies um, began uh, several years ago um, where we decided to you know really look carefully at this issue of the intersection between employment and reentry and the role that employment plays in the transition process for um, uh, youth and adults coming home. Uh, we published the white paper that you can see on the screen here in September of 2013, which we wrote in partnership with the U.S. Department of Justice, Department of Labor, and the Annie Casey Foundation, and were advised by a group of um, folks from both the workforce development and reentry fields, um, wanting to hear about best practices from both of those fields. Fields. And you know the impetus behind writing this white paper um, was that we knew from practitioners, from uh, folks on the ground, that employment is often seen as kind of a key component of a reentry strategy. Um, but the research was a little bit confusing at times. Employment programs not always producing the recidivism reduction results that one might expect. Um, finding that job attainment or job placement didn't necessarily always translate into success. I think for folks who work in programs. There's so much more that goes into a robust reentry approach, but this was surprising researchers, um, and it also really raised the question of should we be investing in employment programs versus other sorts of approaches? We felt yes, but we wanted to know how to make those programs more impactful. So that was the motivation behind this white paper, and we thought, you know, one of the key challenges that programs are running into is that they're 
from the reentry field that we know are important, or vice versa. You had reentry programs that really didn't have the specialized knowledge around good workforce development practices. So how can we bridge those two? Um, and in doing so, the three kind of takeaways I'm going to walk through in this presentation were what you see on the slides here. Repeat it again. How of individuals specific needs are to really match clients to the right types of services for them knowing that a one-size-fits approach one-size-fits-all approach does not work um, and so that was kind of key takeaway one two um, being that we really need to ensure that the workforce development strategies that are being employed are right off the bat um, and then third is that, you know, if your goal is to reduce reoffending, you need to be really thoughtful around how these services are delivered to ensure they incorporate evidence-based practices into that model and address these other criminogenic needs that we know are so important for kind of a holistic approach to, to treating an individual and not just, again, focusing narrowly on the job outcome goals. So with that, let me do a little um, the image on the slide here is um, from the tool that we elaborate upon in our white paper. Um, and kind of the first step, if you will, knowing of course none of this is perfectly sequential in the real world, right, but as a theoretical model, um, to first look at criminogenic risk and needs. And I'm not going to go at length about this. I know you heard about this this morning for folks in the audience here. Um, but, you know, the, the quick takeaway is that we know that, um, you know, youth coming through the system do have different levels of likelihood of reoffending that um, a one-size-fits-all approach that doesn't take that into account is not going to be as effective. Um, and to make sure that your programming is impactful, it's important to target the factors that are actually associated with reoffending, which you see on, on um, the slide here. One of the takeaways looking at this might be, I don't see employment. So uh, you told me to target criminogenic needs. Why, what about employment? But I think it's pretty obvious when you dig into this a little bit that employment can be a really powerful, and employment programming can be a really powerful mechanism by which to address these factors. Um, lack of social attachments, while well, we know that connecting with the workforce or education can create that social attachment. It can also introduce new pro-social peers. Um, it can be a place to kind of practice some of the skill building activities that we know are important. So um, we kind of looked at employment as a really key mechanism for addressing some of the other issues that, are, that you're dealing with with your clients. The second component to this um, was looking at job readiness assessments. And um, this is a place when we talk to folks in the corrections field in particular, it's a little bit new to them. Uh, how do I take into job readiness into account when I make my programming decisions? Like, my gosh, we're just glad we have a program funded. Now you want me to think of the nuances of job readiness. But the more we talk to workforce development professionals, the more important this really came, uh, came to be in terms of our thinking. And for the same reason, reasons, the risk assessment is important. You need to understand the needs you're tackling. Um, and so again, on the board, you, or on the, the PowerPoint here, you can see some of the factors that we we're talking about um, when it comes to job readiness. There isn't necessarily a standard tool for job readiness or an evidence base behind job readiness assessments the way you have with risk. Um, but you know, some of the key factors I don't think are a surprise to anyone, education level, work experience, um, some of the soft or professional skills can be very important. Um, and there's other issues such as log logistical barriers, transportation, health barriers that can also be um, uh, key factors that need to be taken into account. Putting it all together, uh, you have what we call our resource allocation and service matching tool. Um, don't expect anyone to remember that. Uh, but the takeaway is that those two pieces of information combined can help you make kind of a tailored set of decisions around how to provide and package services for someone. And what you'll see is that Groups one and three that are illustrated here have a similar kind of job readiness level. They're a little bit more ready for work, but different risk levels. So you might see that they get similar workforce development approaches are taken. You focus on job placement or some of these other factors that I'll talk about in a minute. But how you deliver those services probably should look different, right? Because you're now talking about a youth um, who probably has maintained family ties, maybe didn't spend as much time incarcerated to get exposed to some of those criminogenic factors, maybe first time in the system, versus somebody who um, maybe this is you know uh, several times through the system now, doesn't have those stronger supports in the community. You know there's some concerns around peer um, and social supports, right? Definitely, as you know, different approaches are going to need for those two individuals. So let's talk a little bit about what those tailored approaches are. For workforce development, um, we kind of broke out a lot of the common workforce development strategies into two groupings. Um, 
you know, things that seem more appropriate for somebody who sets as less job ready and those that seem more appropriate for folks who are more job ready. Um, and there was two key themes that our advisory group really emphasized throughout this, um, is that regardless of where somebody is, you should always be thinking about career pathways, not just some single measure, job placement or slot, but how can I position this individual to um, you know, get the core educational skills and then vocational skills that um, can position them for not just getting a job but continuing to move up and really having that success in a sustainable way. So that's the career pathway model that the Department of Labor has done a lot of great work, I think, on promoting. Secondly, and this is really key too, and more and more I think um, getting attention, is sector-based approaches being important. What jobs are out there? What are employers looking for in terms of skill sets? Is that being taken into account when you make investments in certain training programs? Everyone's heard the story of a training behind the walls that's been there 30 years and there's no jobs left in that industry, right? So how can we keep these trainings up to date? So these are relevant to both, both sides. Um, but you know, when we're talking about somebody who's less job ready, uh, not surprising, the goal is to make them more job ready. So that, that's the focus. And education and training being a key component of that. Um, soft and cognitive skill development, I think it's exceptionally important for this population in particular. You know, how to uh, make folks comfortable with the interviewing process, presenting themselves at a job, showing up on time, these basic things that we often may take for granted, but we know is so important to really address and build those skills. Um, transitional jobs, uh, we kind of see as a job readiness tool, even though it's a great way to get some work experience and some income potentially, but it's a safe kind of structured space that you can get some on the job training and coaching. I think the more these models have become kind of developed um, and, and thought of as a training tool as opposed to just a way to get somebody a short term you know, employment opportunity, it's been really helpful for um, improving job readiness. And then of course addressing non-skill related barriers, housing, transportation, and, and these other factors need to be taken into account. For folks who are more job ready, or ideally as this, as this group of folks make their way towards being more job ready, then the transition, the focus transitions. Um, we start to talk about you know, using, um, but, but we don't stop at just a job placement, right? There's still a lot that goes into this transition into work. So um, job development and coaching, right, which is having somebody who works closely with the individual to prepare them to find a job, as well as somebody who's working with employers on the other side to find those job opportunities and bridging. That's job coaching and development working together. Um, you know, uh, subsidized employment can still be a tool at this place, um, a way to kind of incentivize employers to hire. Um, retention and advancement services, how once somebody is placed, you continue to support them and coach them through that experience, and then what role can work incentives play, um, financial work incentives in connecting them. And so we think of these as kind of program components, things you can kind of package together um, based on somebody's specific circumstances or needs um, to develop kind of a tailored approach as opposed to, again, everyone comes through with the same kind of set of, you know, we prepare you for an interview, put you in a job path, um, and, and help you train and get placed, and then we're kind of moving on to the next person. Where things become uh, a little bit more um, complicated, difficult, uh, is, you know, not just delivering a training or putting somebody in a job place, of thinking about, okay, how am I delivering those services? Am I delivering them in a way that is uh, tailored to now, we're gonna talk about their uh, criminogenic risk, and um, in a way that addresses some of the other factors at hand. And what we all know is that for folks that have been a long history in the system that are higher risk, the way these services deliver will make all the difference in whether they uh, continue to show up and are successful. So I'm gonna talk through five of these different principles um, which uh, you know, you're gonna kind of hear how these then get operationalized on the ground from our other panelists. So um, the first is timing. Uh, and I think everyone here can appreciate how important it is to really minimize that gap between release from an institution or contact with the system to enrollment in a program. And the more you can do that engagement pre-release, the better. So timing being a huge um, aspect of how um, successful folks are. I think research has actually kind of shown with programs that much better results for folks enrolled within three months versus later than that. Oh, sorry about that. So the second is structure time. So once they're enrolled, what are we doing with individuals? Now, for this is particularly important for higher risk individuals who you know are higher risk because of um, some of those, you know, potentially antisocial, you know, peers or um, other activities that they're engaging in. They may not have, uh, you know, the supports in the community that they can lean on. So the more your program can help structure their time into those core social activities, the more effective it can be. And being creative to think about how to create a space where folks can really connect with you as they need throughout the day can be really powerful. Third uh, is looking at engagement. And so 
this is a very big catch-all and a very critical one in terms of these service delivery principles. How are we engaging the client in an individualized approach um, to really address um, their specific needs in this process? And here, um, cognitive behavioral interventions is, is the term you want to keep in mind in designing your program. So, what are we doing to not just uh, you know, train the hard work skills, but this is kind of going back to the soft skills. How do we tackle those in the context of, of a workforce or employment program? Um, you know, the cognitive behavioral in interventions are, are focused on the thinking patterns that get people kind of in trouble in the first place and make it hard for them to show up. What's driving that? What are some of the challenges you're trying to address? Um, then kind of working through that with the individual and identifying alternative skills to help prepare them for work, for education, for success, um, and modeling uh, those skills, working on role play, um, you know, kind of talking through alternative ways of responding to a situation. I think what's really important to think about, you know, we often talk about cognitive behavioral interventions in the context of a curriculum, right, classroom-based curriculum, thinking for a change, or some of these other um, curriculums that are evidence-based. Um, but we know that for a lot of folks, connection to the workforce is, is an imperative. It's financial, it's, it's critical. So is there a, a, a balance then between that you know, concern about not being able to go through a full classroom setting, but knowing I need to address cognitive behavioral interventions, um, but having kind of a different mechanism to deliver that? And I think yes. Um, I think what the field is moving towards um, is a model by which in just a short case management meeting, 30 minutes, you can go through an exercise with somebody on this. Let's look at a challenge you had during the program today. Um, let's understand why you had that problem. Why didn't you show up on time today? Let's then identify alternative ways to deal with that problem in the future and let's practice that and model that. So we're seeing community corrections through the EPICS model for folks who have heard about that using this. I think it can be applied in, in um, uh, a program setting as well. Um, if you're doing transitional jobs, that's another great opportunity, training your uh, workforce supervisors um, on some of those different um, approaches. How can they use cognitive behavioral interventions in their approach? So these are some of the key things that, again, with working with higher risk youth in particular, really important to keep in mind. Fourth is incentives. Um, you know, how do you incentivize program participation and retention? And you can think about this two different ways. There's the, kind of the hard incentives of, you know, might be financial, um, you know, providing tokens or bus certificate, bus tokens or other things that help folks, um, even wages for certain work programs. But it also is about motivation. You know, and enhancing intrinsic motivation, why folks want to show up, and using your MI skills and those sorts of things to help keep people incentivized. And then fifth and finally, coordination, another loaded one, right? But we know that no single program can address this on their own, and so um, how can you reflect on who do I need to work with in my community to get this high-risk individual who probably has a whole uh, you know, complex set of needs addressed, and we know that coordinating with corrections is essential in this, with the education system, if you're talking about workforce development is essential, um, coordinating uh, with behavioral health service providers, and a lot of you are working with folks who have behavioral health needs, so how do you coordinate all of that? So, that is kind of the, the five principles and that are elaborated on at greater length in our white paper. I'm going to stop there. And again, you're going to hear a little bit about how those get operationalized in a program model for Monica in particular. Um, but I will stop. We have about 10 minutes if you have any questions about this. And then we will transition to the next presenter. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Hi, so we have a couple of themes coming in. Uh, the largest theme is since there's no standardized job assessment right now in the field for the Justice Center, what would you recommend um, folks to do uh, in terms of you know, starting this work for employment for kids coming in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we're actually piloting how to implement this model kind of at a systems level in two sites, uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Palm Beach County, Florida, and figuring out, you know, how do you, as a corrections agent, look at the host of providers in your community, use assessments to get them to the one who's best equipped to meet their needs? And they all seem to have good risk assessment information. They're really struggling on the job readiness piece. Um, they go to their workforce you know, development center or their one-stop shop and they have about seven um, and they're not quite sure how to, to reconcile those different ones. Um, they maybe have information about employment within their, um, their uh, compass or risk assessment, but they're not sure how that factors in. Um, the short answer is the, you know, the field doesn't quite have a standardized assessment on this or standardized um, set of criteria for the assessment like we do with risk assessments. Um, 
but there's common themes uh, that I think folks are starting to tease out. Um, the Department of Education, actually, the U.S. Department of Education developed an employability skills framework, um, which is a really fantastic resource on this that looks at kind of three different sets of skills. There's kind of interpersonal skills um, and how to assess those. There's more kind of hard vocational skills and looking at that. Um, and then there is more of kind of the uh, education background. So they're kind of combining those three to look at a holistic readiness for work. Um, a lot of other assessments might actually look at career interests, which are important when thinking about career pathways and how to help people. So, um, you know, what I'd recommend is, um, you know, in part, you know, it's obvious what some of the, the barriers are, right? The job readiness being driven by um, <clears throat> work experience, education level, um, you know, and, uh, and some of the, the soft skills that you can kind of assess coming in and working with somebody. Um, recommend talking to your workforce development center on some of the assessment tools they're using. They're probably the ones who know best uh, what's new in the field, what seems to be working. Um, but it, you know, the, the long and short of it is we're kind of working through that right now with some of our pilot sites. And I think uh, the field is, is getting to a higher level of sophistication on that, but no easy answers at this point. Any other questions? Yes. So I, I was wondering ab about a dimension of this. Maybe it's an overarching piece, which is about relationships. And you know, I know we talk a lot about the offenders being trained on how to behave and interact in interviews and keep jobs and, and things of that nature. But when it comes to, to the initial decision of an employer to employ an ex-offender or an offender who's on in a reentry status, it seems that a lot of that has to be about how we help that youth or that young adult build relationships with the potential employer. Do you have any thoughts about within this paradigm, understanding through the assessment some of the challenges these kids have, how we best do that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so uh, there's a couple ways to think about that. Um, you know, one is kind of the role of the program and starting to build a relationship with employers to even kind of get the foot in the door and get them comfortable with knowing they might be hiring somebody with a criminal record. And I think we've seen a lot of really tremendous progress on that front, both kind of from a national perspective, just breaking down the stigma with efforts like Ban the Box and some of these other initiatives. But more at the individual level, there's a lot of employers out there already doing this who don't necessarily talk about it, um, who have are comfortable working with this population know that there's you know that there's some challenges that may come with that um, but you know a lot of employers when you talk to them um, find that this population can be just as effective if not harder working than some of the other folks coming in who may have similar education levels right just not the, the criminal justice involvement um, and one of the things that employers has uh, have emphasized before, and we've seen this in survey data, we've seen this in kind of our firsthand experience, is that if the, pro the program can kind of serve as an intermediary organization to some extent, kind of be there to provide, um, you know, good kind of consistent referrals, um, to troubleshoot if a problem comes up, to kind of promise that we can backfill if something doesn't work out the way you intended, so they don't have to worry about some of that kind of more business bottom line issues. That can go a really long way, right? So that's the program role I think in this and then with the the individuals that's exactly the sorts of soft skills you're trying to build with them and help them understand that it's not just about showing up and kind of just doing your job but building a you know personal relationship with your boss with your co-workers and how to think through that um, and I think you know once somebody is placed those retention and follow-up uh, components of your program should really focus on that asking or understanding how these interpersonal skills are being developed and coaching and working through that um, so just a couple ways to, to think about it Any other questions before we transition? Okay. If we have time at the end too, we can kind of do more general questions as well, I think. So, great. So how about I transition then with Dr. Lasante, who is going to talk about um, this from an education perspective. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, like <coughs> Phoebe said, this is my 37th year in the public school system. <laughs> and is, uh, the good news in, in that is this continuity of leadership. Uh, so we've made a lot of progress. We've got a long way to go, but we've made a lot of progress, in, and I want to share some of the promising practices. The bad news is, as I can't blame my predecessor for anything. <laughs> nobody knows who my predecessor is 37 years ago. But the way, the way we always start this is with this. This is our goal. Uh, we're the school system. We want every student to graduate. There's 10 principals in my district. 
uh, and we have one goal, all students graduate college and career ready. So what we tell the principals all the time is analyze your successes. These students here, they all graduated uh, with a high school diploma or a high school equivalency diploma. Here in New York, it's very difficult to get a high school diploma or a high school equivalency. You need 44 credits, you have to pass 44 classes, and five exiting exams called Regents exams that are going on today, as a matter of fact. Very rigorous to get a high school diploma here. And the high school equivalency diploma is uh, difficult, more difficult than high school, some of the Regents exams, uh, as far as math and things like that. So we want to analyze this population, what worked for them, take those promising practices and bring them into the detention facilities. And over the years, this is how the, the district has developed now. Um, and we want to use education, our experience in detention facilities to see how we could keep kids out of, out of detention, right? Out of jail, out of prison. Uh, so that's our first thing I want to talk to you about. Then I'm gonna talk to you about uh, <coughs> what we do while students are in detention, and then uh, lastly, the aftercare piece. So a couple of prevention programs we have up here. Uh, as you see in the bottom right hand, we have court liaisons. They work for the district. They're in all the courts, in the family courts. And they work with the judges, they work with the lawyers, they work with probation to try to keep kids from going into detention. They will ask the judge, we have an alternative school, we have a placement for the student if you give him a second chance. So we have a couple of upfront alternatives to detention. One of them is the judge can send students to a school. Um, it's called the PEAK program. Uh, probation runs it. They get extra support as far as counselors. And the students go there for six months. If they do well, they can stay in the school or they can transfer out uh, back to their home school. So school is a placement option for a judge. That's another way education has been involved in um, uh, preventing students from coming into the facility. In New York, we have a very weird age. I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but if you're 15 or 14 and get arrested, you go into one system, which is the child welfare system, uh, uh, ACS. Um, much more of a youth development model, obviously. If you're 16 or older, you go to Rikers Island, which is an adult correction top-down model, which doesn't work and has never worked. As Phoebe said, I was the principal there. <coughs> I spent 10 years there teaching every day, uh, and leading schools, and um, it's, it's, a really, it's probably the worst place for a teenager to be in New York State is, is Rikers Island, because nothing gets customized for 16 and 17-year-olds. For example, they had to take tests today Something goes on in the facility, there's a, a lockdown or something, th those kids miss the test. You can't make that test up. It's, it's required to be given at a certain time. Uh, if the kid goes to court or, or commissary or something like that, all kinds of ridiculous things. So uh, there's a move in New York to get those 16s and 17s into ACS custody, uh, which is much more of that youth development model, and that's hum something we can't wait to happen because it's gonna be so much better for the students. So if you look to the right there, we also run Restart Academy, which is students that are in substance abuse intervention programs, either residential here in New York City or upstate, or day programs. Uh, many times the judges will give students this in lieu of detention or, or jail. So we run the teachers there. If a student doesn't go or doesn't make it there, they get remanded, they wind up in jail. So that's another prevention program, and our principal, our teachers are in that program. There are also Restart Academies also in therapeutic communities. <coughs> For example, here in Manhattan, we have a great one. Uh, kids have internal uh, emotional disorders, things like phobias, anxiety, stress. They turn to drugs. Now they have this co-occurring disorder, right? And it's a place called CARES. It's uh, part of St. Luke's Hospital. A very good therapeutic community. Uh, there's about 50 students in there. Our teachers go in. Um, and it's a model, I think, for teenagers. And I keep saying the detention folks have to see this model and take those promising practices and move them into the jail instead of go visiting jails and prisons and, and seeing what doesn't work. Take something that does work in the community and adapt it to the school, uh, uh, to the detention school. One of the things we adapted right away is, and, and you probably noticed by working with the population, the most challenging thing for me as a teacher in Rikers <coughs> was the continuous admissions and discharges, right? Kids coming in and out every day. So what we have now in, in our programs our six week semester. The students can earn credits toward the high school diploma in six weeks if they pass the assessments. So they take fewer classes per day, if you will, but for a longer period of time. Uh, and then what happens here in New York, which is great, is the principals put their 
grades right onto their report card, the New York City report card transcript. So when the students go back, there's no haggling with the home school about courses or paper transmission. Everything's electronic. So th and you print the transcript. We send them home to the parents. Uh, and then it's, say, you came in, you had three credits. Now you're up to six. You know, another six weeks, you'd be up to nine. Uh, so modifying the school curriculum was another promising practice that we learned over the years. The other thing that we learned, I don't know, raise your hand if you deal with seventh graders. Not too many. Eighth graders? So seventh and eighth grade middle school is a whole different dynamic, right? It's a whole different curriculum. There's different state assessments. When we opened up Spotford uh, uh, in 1998, when we came into Spotford, which is uh, juvenile justice, uh, we thought it was going to be all ninth and tenth graders. Uh, at one time, we had 29% of the students were middle school. 29% were seventh and eighth graders. That's a lot. If you went to a neighboring county here, Nassau County, Westchester County, you probably wouldn't find any eighth graders, seventh graders in, in lockup. Uh, so what we did was we, <coughs> we were tired of sending those kids back to a failing uh, middle school, so we started alternative middle schools under Restart Academy. And the cool thing about them is they're housed in high schools, right? So now the student who was big and overaged and didn't want to go to eighth grade, now he's in a high school. And we explain, they, they sign a contract, you're not in high school until you pass these assessments, do well. And then they transfer into the school at the end of the quarter or the end of the semester. So we're up to now, we're tr our goal is to have two in every borough. That would give us 10, 25 kids in a program. That's 250 of the most at-risk eighth graders. So that's another thing that came out of the detention world in the community side. So if you look on the right, that's what we call the Youth Justice Education and Treatment. So we have one principal who works with the 15 and unders, that's Passages Academy. And we have another principal on Rikers Island that works uh, at East River Academy. And these are multi-sided. They're usually run by an AP, and the principal's itinerant goes around and evaluates all the teachers. We're in the new teacher evaluation system. I don't know if your states uh, were part of that for this year. Uh, so our teachers are under the same uh, uh, supervision as a teacher in a high school would be. We didn't get an exemption just because they were uh, in, in this uh, situation. And over here on the left, <coughs> if you look at the upper left, we have what we call referral centers, one in each borough. We want to break down the obstacles of getting back into school. In the old days, you got to bring your IEP, bring your transcript, you know, bring your immunization shots. You know, you talk to 17, 18 year old kids. Uh, now everything's, uh, if you're 17 or older, you can go into a referral center um, yeah, by yourself. You don't even need a parent. And these are for students that aren't sure if they want to go high school diploma or high school equivalency. So we'll pull up the transcript, and we use a rule, I if you're under 17 credits and 17 years old, we try to steer for high school equivalency. If you have a lot of credits, we'll send you back to a transfer school. And if you can see it up there, last year we served <coughs> kids from 98 different countries and over 30 states, uh, which, which is amazing to me. Uh, I say that's more than half the country and more than countries that are in FIFA. <laughs> hopefully without the corruption, but 98 different countries. Because what happens here in New York is that um, if you're 17, 18, 19, you come to the country, uh, you don't have a shot for a high school diploma. They bring it to alternatives, and you work on a high school equivalency diploma. Unfortunately, it's only offered in English and Spanish. So a lot of students have to learn the language. So it's more of a language acquisition for a lot of students than it is for a high school equivalency. It's kind of a misnomer. That's on the left. Then we also have a big vocational school, as Phoebe mentioned. It's got 17 different options under one roof up here in Manhattan. Uh, it's a great place for kids because there's choice, right? And we don't give students enough choice or, or enough voice, uh, in my opinion. So students go there and say, hey, I want auto mechanics. They go to auto mechanics. A week later, they don't like auto mechanics. Well, we got culinary arts. We got cosmetology. We got all kinds of IT stuff under one roof. And it's a shared instruction model, meaning a half a day right, they on the trade and then half a day in academics. It's, it's a neat model. And again, in New York, you have more options as a 17-year-old than you do as a 16-year-old. So probation came to us and said, can you do anything for our 16-year-olds who have, mm -hmm. uh, so we started a, a small program in that vocational school for 16-year-olds, and it's sort of like a pre-GED program. They'll transition next year at 17 into the GED program. Very successful, about 15 kids on probation, get one PO, build those relationships that we were talking about before, uh, uh, and it's been very successful. So again, learning from detention uh, and bringing it into the community. 
And the last one we have here is we run child care for student parents. <coughs> if you're a student and you're a parent, you're entitled to free child care uh, by our early child care teachers, and they all get a social worker. And the social worker helps with the parenting skills and navigating the school system and uh, college uh, applications and things like that. And I'm very happy to say this month in June, more than 100 students who have parents in our life center are, are graduating. And if it wasn't for this intervention, uh, they may not have. So this is, our district is more than just, and that's an important promising practice because too many times I've been around the country probably in 20 different cities, and a lot of times the jails are isolated, the jail schools are isolated from the school system. That's why I keep saying we're the public school system. We're all, those two principals who are on Rikers and, and Juvenile Justice, they meet every month with nine other principals from the community. So they're part of a larger network. They collaborate themselves on curriculum, and, and services like that, but it's nice to be part of uh, the entire school uh, community. So we have 165 sites throughout New York City and, and three in upstate counties. So I want to get into the promising practices, what happens when a student does get arrested, we can't keep them out. And uh, I always go with the five A's. <coughs> this is something we developed over the years. The first A is address. It, uh, it came up that uh, many students are not going to live in the same address as when they were arrested, especially students that are in uh, foster care, right? So we work closely with the uh, uh, child welfare system and whatever agency is running that foster care. Uh, <coughs> so that's one, it's something we took for granted, but we were chasing kids down. We had the wrong addresses. We, we didn't have the apartment number. We had the different name on the mailbox. So our aftercare piece was failing because we didn't have the right information. We're chasing kids with inaccurate information. So the first thing we always say, where are you going to live when you get out? You know, it, we're not assuming. And then we update our records to make sure that we can uh, provide support after a student leaves. The second one is age, right? <coughs> uh, again, we have 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 14 to 18. Not much four years chronologically, but huge in youth development, right? That's, that's a freshman in high school and a senior. On Rikers Island, nobody ever says, keep the 40-year-old men away from the 44-year-old men, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but here, 14, 18, huge gap. Uh, makes it harder for us to educate us because now we have to have a class for the middle school kids, and even though they may be on the same reading level, that we can't mix them, et cetera. Uh, as I said before, the older you get in New York, the more options you have. The high school equivalency comes into play at 17. Vocational training comes in at 17. So that's 16, we're trying to get more options for that uh, in-between area. 15, you're basically going back to high school. 16 is where you're kind of in the middle. So age is an important factor. <coughs> uh, the other one is achievement. So we pull up the transcript, how many credits, how many regents have you passed? Uh, you're 18, you got no credits, you haven't passed any regents, you know, let's go on a high school equivalency path. Uh, the third, uh, the fourth A is aptitude. Did the student not get any credits because uh, they didn't go, they were truant? which is we're finding uh, a variable in almost all probation cases. Not Kids don't get locked up for truancy, but it, it plays into it, right? It makes sense. The kid's not engaged in school, gets in trouble. <coughs> or does it, is there a reading problem? Again, I don't know how it is in your cities, but <coughs> we're up to 54% of the students uh, in juvenile justice who have been classified with a disability, 54%. Uh, unbelievable. And most of it, or at least half of it, is uh, emotional behavior disorders, which you know is the number one dropout category and the number one category to get arrested. So we need intensive mental health issue, uh, uh, services while the students are with us. And that's one thing we've been lacking, and I'll get into that in, in a second, is, is the mental health services, especially on, on Rikers Island. Uh, and the last one is the attitude, the fifth day. Uh, what, what does the student want? You know. Uh, when you get out, where do you want to go to school? You want to go to a big school, a small school? You want to go to an art school? Uh, do you want to go to a vocational school? And we'll try to make a match. What I don't want is to send a kid back to a school where he wasn't going or, <coughs> or, or was failing him. So we developed a policy 10 years ago. It's called homeschool reentry. The students have the automatic right to go back to their home school. Uh, prior to that, 10 years ago, students would get discharged from the school. They could be with us for a week. They go home the next court date. They had to fight their way to get back into school because they were taken off that school's register. So homeschool reentry re is probably the best thing that I've done in my career because it affects thousands of students every year. So it's a safety, but I tell my people, it's a safety net placement. You know, just don't automatically send a kid back. If you do that, I, I don't need you. 
you know? What I want you to do is talk to the student, talk to the family, and say, hey, can we enact a transfer so when you get out, you're in a better position to, to become one of those graduates we, we saw in the very beginning. Uh, the second phase we talk about all the time is the handoff is so critical. So one of the things that we do now is our counselors follow the students from detention, make the appointments in the community. All right, so in other words, our counselors are no longer full-time in the detention facil facility. They split their time between the detention facility and the community. I, I'm out in the field every Tuesday and Thursday. Come meet me next Tuesday. You know, if you get released from court, boom, here's my card. Come meet me here. And they walk them through the, the process because you can do all the planning that you want. Kids will say a lot of things, especially one-on-one, -on -one, behind closed doors, but then they get out, they're not really thinking about going to school the very next day, and we want to get kids back in. Because the recidivism rates show that in that first month of release, that's the uh, critical period. So it has to be a seamless, so that handoff is something very, uh, very important. One of the promising practices we have is a web-based planning tool called Plan to Succeed. Every student, when he comes into detention, gets a password, can activate the account. It's got career search we were talking about before, it's germane to New York, jobs that are available in New York. It's got resume writing tutorials. It's got um, uh, college uh, searches and things like that. Uh, and you can p the student puts in his or her goals. And now if that kid gets transferred within the system, bounced around, or goes home, all he needs is the password, opens up that account. It's one of the best things that we've done. No more paper plans. They didn't make it outside the facility. Now everything's web-based, digital platform called Plan to Succeed. Five minutes, all right. Um, and again, the counselors following the students into the community, supporting them, their families, and the receiving school. Again, as a former principal, it, it means a lot to me if, if the parents come in with the child and there's somebody from the community also there, like advocating, say, this way we know all of us are going to work together and try to get the student uh, back, on, back on track. Um, so that's one of the big changes we made this year. <coughs> so again, um, transitioning beginning day one is something I didn't mention, but all those five A's, you can do the first day. You start the first day, and you set the wheels in motion. If the student leaves, I'm going to call the parents, say, hey, your son says he wants to go to art school. Is that okay with you? Does it make sense? I'll start work on it. Then we put it into plan to succeed. I'd like to go to an art school when I get out. Uh, and then also what I put in there is the counselor's phone number uh, and email. This way, when you get out, if you go out the next court date, Go into your plans to succeed and, you know, find my number, text me, let me know what's happening. Uh, now, during incarceration, we talked about the close to home model, which we know. Um, <coughs> this was something that started a couple of years ago. In the past, a 15-year-old who got sentenced or placed would go into the state system, go upstate five, six, seven hours away, 15 years old. And a few years ago, the governor came in, the mayor, Everybody said, hey, New York City could do this better. Let's keep our kids at home. So what we did was we contracted out with providers like Boys Town and, and other local providers, and they run uh, residents, like group homes, with 10, 12 uh, uh, students. But the cool thing is every day they get in the van and they come to a school building. You know, we don't do the education downstairs or uh, around the dining room table, something like that. They come to an actual school building with 15 teachers and a library and a computer lab and a gymnasium, you know, this, uh, now this was a great idea, it was my idea, um, <laughs> but the implementation was really, really odd. I mean, everybody hated us, the police department hated us, the custodians, because the kids were kicking holes in the school walls and everything, but in the long run, it's turned out to be a great thing, right? Uh, again, it's much more getting acclimated to going to school uh, than if you were around the dining room table for six months of placement, you know. But the coolest thing is that you get those 15 highly qualified teachers. You got a science teacher and a math teacher and a, and, uh, um, a special ed education teacher, ELL education teacher. So we love the close to home model. <coughs> we have a bunch of handouts that explain, go deeper into these uh, as well. And ABLE, what you see here is something they've done on Rikers where they've, uh, they have community-based organizations that actually do therapy. They come out, <coughs> uh, so we do the academics, and a CBO does the adolescent uh, treatment therapy each day. It's part of the school schedule. Like seventh period, the kids go to a CBO who runs. Uh, and those CBOs are also working with students when they get out, the Osborne Association, uh, people like that uh, here in New York. 
And the last thing I want to talk about is every one of my principals has a report card. We have three years of data. And every quarter I review that with them and we look at a couple of key statistics. One is post-program attendance. So we track students when they go back to school for a couple of months and then we take the average and then we'll say, hey, it went up, it went down, it stayed flat. What can we do to uh, make it better? So more kids are going back to school than ever before. Uh, our research has shown they're doing well for about a semester, but a big drop off the second semester. So we want to see how can we keep that going all the way through graduation. So using report cards and that data for planning strategy and interventions is very important. Not just for accountability, more so say, hey, where can we put our limited resources to make the most sense? Oops. <coughs> and the other thing is, again, uh, as Phoebe mentioned, the hardest thing, I think, in, in, in this world is coordinating services. New York has a tremendous amount of resources, but everybody reports to somebody else. It's very difficult. And the families many times are marginalized uh, and not as involved. How much what does that say? <laughs> One minute. Okay. Um, the other good thing that we have here in New York City is we have a lot of interagency collaborations in, in the committees and we share this information, do cross trainings. And the other thing is there's a group called the New York, S New York City Reentry Network. They're providers who got grants like you do, but they get together once a month and they share information and promising practices. Again, all, all the mayor pays for is one coordinator, but they all come uh, voluntarily and get together. I think I've talked about all of those things, except for the success coaches, which is a new development for next year where <coughs> ACS is going to have people who can help navigate their system for these cross-system kids as well as us. We're a huge system, huge, huge bureaucracy, very hard to navigate, even for me. Uh, how is it for parents and, and kids? Uh, so we're going to have success coaches that are going to help navigate for those students that are in uh, foster care as well. So again, we go back to this. This is our major objective, and these are our um, objectives for next year. A couple more real quick. Out of school time, making better use of out of school time. The biggest mistake I made in my career was not making these 12-month schools. They're 10-month schools. Real downtime during the summer. We're trying to do as much as we can. After school, school recesses, things like that. Better use of out of school time. And blended learning is, is one of the best things to come along in a long time for this population. Uh, using the computer, uh, kids can get caught up on courses that they, they didn't pass back in high school. So those are one of two of our big initiatives is expanding blended learning and expanding um, out of school time. <coughs> Any questions? Questions? Right. Yes. Uh, microphone. <coughs> Do I get an extra 30 seconds now? <laughs> the, the homeschool reentry program, yes. is that, was that a legislative act or how did you get all? Uh, that was a pain in the neck, man, I tell you. <laughs> it took us three chances and the way we got it through is times of transition is the best time to do some of this stuff. You try to zap it to the new chancellor before they know what's going on or they want to be different than the last guy. Uh, so it's a chances regulation, uh, and, and again, the other two chances, the high schools pushed back. The high schools didn't want this, uh, but what we did. It took us a long time to negotiate it, but it's a chances uh, rule. One of the other things that uh, is pretty cool that I recommend as a promising practice is advisory class. Does anybody have advisory class as part of your school day? First period every morning, I taught advisory on Rikers Island. <coughs> all the detention facilities, first period. So the advisor becomes that relationship we were talking about before, right, as the teacher. And then the clinician also comes in first period, like the counselor, the social worker. And then the transition specialist also comes in. So there's three people make up a primary support network for one student. So whenever they, a student has a problem or has a question, who's your family group teacher? You know, who's your advisory group teacher? So it's those three people that get things done. So that's another thing I recommend. There's a curriculum, right? There's a lot of good curricula out there for this. So that it's not just a rap session, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's a set curriculum. But you got teachers that have been trained, like if there's a problem in the housing area the night before, things like that, they address it right there. And then uh, instead of having kids, you know, jump into math at 8 o'clock in the morning, we start off with advisory. It's been a great, something I recommend highly 
I, I, as a family group teacher, advisory group teacher, it was one of the best things I think that we did. And when information had to be shared, had guest speakers and things like that, you have different family groups get together. So that's another one <coughs> that we're expanding to next year. Any other questions? We have a question in the back. Uh, so you talked a lot about the different data that's collected through the report cards and the online database and things like that. Um, and I know that especially when we're talking about youth, there's a lot of considerations around privacy mandates and making sure that the data is used uh, appropriately. Um, so I was hoping you could talk to kind of the data sharing agreements that you have you know, with ACS or with um, mental health providers or things like that to make sure that the data is used. Yeah, it's still a big problem. You know, because we have all these individual MOUs, one-offs with different city agencies. I wish there was one for New York City. We all work for the same mayor. Um, but for years, we haven't been able to get it done. And, and I think education, because of FERPA, we, we tend to be the most conservative in, in sharing information. Uh, well, so what we said to the everybody about the report cards is it's not public information. It's used for planning purposes for, the, for interventions. Uh, this way, the principals don't feel a, as threatened I do use it as part of their evaluations. You know, I have to. I said, you know, if, if uh, uh, achievement has gone down three years in a row, but it's uh, it, uh, it's still a big issue in sharing information and and uh, the FERPA laws because again, on Rikers and in uh, uh, juvenile justice, we have also the Department of Mental Health, another city agency involved. So you got Department of Ed, you got Child Welfare, you got Department of Correction, Department of Probation. Uh, a lot of city agencies, but we haven't s resolved the <coughs> – and what we're trying to do is work more with the parents and get their release upon uh, uh, um, admission in, into the facilities. Again, informed consent from parents. Yeah. Uh, what kind of diploma and transcript do the uh, graduates get, and do they have issues when they try to go to uh, secondary education institutions? Yeah. So again – our programs don't grant a diploma. Uh, if we have a, le a legitimate 12th grader who has enough credits, we make an arrangement with the home school, and they'll tell us what courses the student has to pass and what regents exams, and then they'll, they'll get a high school diploma from that school. Uh, and the schools are very cooperative because they're not really doing any work, and they're getting credit for a high, high school graduate. Um, the big thing that we're working on now is CTE certifications, right? We want these to be meaningful, we mentioned before, uh, what we really want to do is get the students excited about something that they continue in the community. For example, we have culinary arts on Rikers. If you take that certificate into Manhattan, into Co-op Tech, the school of town, uh, you automatically get a paid internship if you enroll in that program. Uh, last year, I'm proud to say, almost a half a million dollars went into the pockets of students in our district through paid internships. Uh, best way to learn social skills and, and uh, the job readiness we were talking about before and the average age of our students is very old. Uh, the graduates here was 20.3. These are 20-year-old um, men and women. So they all need extra money, and they need money. So uh, we have a huge paid internship program. Um, uh, but as far as the diploma, and then the high school equivalency diploma is a state diploma that you have to pass that rigorous exam. Yep. You mentioned the adoption of cross-systems trainings that are made yeah. available. Can you talk about that? Yes, yeah, pretty neat. Uh, this is something that came out of one of those uh, committees that we have, Juvenile Justice Advisory Committee, who has an educational that I co-chair. And for next year, what we're asking is that probation run cross-training on some of the alternatives to incarceration and detention. Uh, it breaks my heart that there's ATI seats available here for 16 to 21 year olds that aren't being filled. Uh, I don't understand that. Uh, I know our, our teachers really want to know more about the court system when they hear these things, you know. Uh, so we're going to run the piece of uh, education while they're in detention. And then ACS, we're asking to run cross-training as far as aftercare and support after the students get out. But again, there's a lot of adults, but in my opinion, we need to be better coordinated, and I think these trainings will, will do that. Um, but I, ha I think they have to be continuous because things change all the time. And, and, and um, so we want to have ongoing cross-training among uh, city agencies. And, and community providers, too, not just government uh, folks. Thank you. Um, so 
I think it's wonderful that you've managed to adopt a policy that basically allows these kids to get back to their home school. In so many communities around the country, they're mandated to go to alternative schools yeah. for a set period of time to prove they're ready to come back to their home school. That leaves the issue, though, that when they go back to their home school, often those schools don't want them. Their perception of them is as they were six or nine or 12 months ago, as opposed to the great progress they've made while they've been in care uh, and, and receiving services. Do you have any thoughts or how have you addressed some of the, the transitional issues about that perception yeah. and what supports these kids need to be successful back in their home school? Yeah, and that's why, again, the data comes into play. For each counselor, what is your post-program attendance rate? Are you just sending kids back to the school that they're failing at, or are you really doing digging? These folks have to be very resourceful and say, listen, we got five, 500 high schools in New York City, 500, over 500. It, shame on us if we can't make the right match uh, in, in that. Um, so again, it was really a safety net for those students that were going to school, uh, but the first thing after you meet with the student, you call the school, he wants to come back, and then they say, no way, we're not taking him back, I don't care what you say. Um, uh, we, we don't want to set a kid up for failure. The thing is, to be honest with you, we don't have enough options within those 500, believe it or not, that will take students with less than 10 credits, which is a lot of our students. Everybody will take kids who have 10 credits or pass the regents, you know, because they're on their way to a diploma. Uh, but as a principal, my number one thing I get graded on is my four-year graduation rate. Is this kid going to help me or not? And most times they're going to say, I'm taking on a chance on the kids. So we have to give the principals some relief, uh, and some of the transfer schools especially. And that's something that we really need to work on it, is having more options. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. We're now going to transition to uh, Monica Zito-Martin. I'm going to pass this down. There you go. <coughs> Who's going to speak about uh, her experience with um, connecting folks, uh, youth, back into employment, um, working as the Senior Vice President for Program Impact uh, with Youth Build USA. Great. Go ahead. Thank you, Phoebe. Uh, there's, there's nothing quite like being the last person on the panel that happens after lunch. Uh, so, so thank you for um, your attention to this work and, and working with this population. Uh, again, my name is Monica Zeno-Martin. I serve as Senior Vice President at Youth Build USA, and one of my key areas of focus is Youth Build USA's criminal justice initiatives. Uh, so today, as we discuss reconnecting youth to education and employment, particularly youth who have been engaged in the juvenile justice system, uh, I, I want to sorry, advancing through the slide. Uh, I want to make sure that I share with you a little bit about Youth Build. so that they can prepare for employment. Um, youth Bell programs are offering both secondary education and a wide range of skills training and then transition into employment, uh, along with a host of other services that we'll talk about uh, along the way as we move forward. Uh, but Youth Build is not just a program, it is also a movement. Uh, and so 37 some odd years ago when the youth bill work started, uh, it had an initial reach that was focused uh, very specifically in the East Harlem area, uh, but has now grown. There are over 260 youth bill programs in the United States, uh, and we also work in over 15 countries internationally. So in that realm, uh, we do business domestically as Youth Build USA and then internationally as 
on our Uh, so for both Youthville USA and Youthville International, uh, we provide technical assistance and training to a host of programs who are affiliated with the organization. So we operate under an umbrella that is Youthville Incorporated and then again domestically Youthville USA and Youthville International. In both cases we are providing technical assistance to those programs who are affiliates of Youthville USA and many who are receiving sub-grants from uh, Youthville USA or Youthville International. And I will focus most specifically on the work that we've done domestically. Uh, but this is what the Youthville model looks like. At the core, it is focused on moving Opportunity Youth into uh, their own leadership so that they can really realize their own potential uh, in their families, in their Youthville programs, in their communities, and obviously also uh, globally. And the model grows from there. There's a strong focus on community service. Many youth-filled programs are engaged in a work through AmeriCorps, so young people receive, uh, participate in AmeriCorps and then receive a stipend, an educational stipend. Uh, a focus on education. Youth-filled programs are offering high school diplomas, uh, high school equivalency uh, credential, or both. Some youth-filled programs are community-based programs, others are charter schools, some are standalones, others are inside of national organizations that you know, like Goodwill or the National Urban League or YMCA or YWCAs. Uh, and counseling and case management is, is an important part of the youth-filled model, uh, along with a focus on construction skills training and graduate opportunity. And graduate opportunity is essentially that young person moving into post-secondary education, uh, or moving into employment. When the Youthville model was founded uh, some 37 odd years ago, young people who helped to start that program noticed that there was a lot of blight in their communities and they were very focused on changing the landscape in the communities in which they lived. So those initial days of Youthville really focused on young people developing the construction and building trade skills that they needed in order to improve their communities. Uh, but as we all know, it's important for programs and for young people to be able to connect to the opportunities that are available in their particular uh, industry. And so youthville programs now respond to the labor market needs, employer and hiring needs. Many are offering construction along with anything, healthcare, IT, solar paneling, green, uh, you name it, youthville programs are being responsive to what's happening in their local communities. In the youth build uh, movement, there are youth build programs that are serving young people who have been engaged in the juvenile justice system. Just as a course of their natural recruitment and their programming and their partnerships. But Youth Build USA has learned its most deep lessons and its promising practices most through national grants and national initiatives that have then been subgranted to youth build programs around the country. Uh, so through that kind of work as a national intermediary, we have over 260 programs uh, with our court-involved youth work. We have served over 800 young people through 40-plus programs who were receiving technical assistance, uh, funding, and support through Youthville USA. And so we have, over the years, made adjustments to the core Youthville model so that it could be most responsive to the needs of young people who are engaged in the justice system. And that means having the core youth build model at the center, but also including the things that you see here. So work behind the walls, flexible programming, uh, mentoring, alternative career tracks, crime and violence prevention, and state advocacy. The behind the walls piece is unique for some of our programs. Many of them were already engaged uh, behind the walls in correctional facilities. And not all youth build programs are well, well positioned to do this, but what we have found is that the programs who are move their young people more quickly and deeply towards success, right? So those young people are meeting someone from the youth build program while they are incarcerated. That staff person from the youth build program is able to begin services inside the facility. And then once the young person is released, they then matriculate through the community-based youth build program. So we've got deeper relationships that started earlier, longer time for service delivery. And there's a range of what these services look like. In some cases, it's a program that is going inside a correctional facility and focused on referrals. In other cases, we have youth build programs that are co-located 
inside the correctional institution so they have access, they have access to data, release dates, they're providing services. I'm glad to say that one of those programs is here, uh, Dreams Youth Bill, which is in uh, Brooklyn. And I know that Dr. Lasante knows that program also. So we found that the behind the walls piece, if it can be done, uh, really helps move young people towards success. Then the flexible programming piece. So youth build programs by and large operate on a cohort based model and many of them follow an academic year. So right, that means that they're bringing in young people in September and then they are uh, staying with that cohort through May or June. And so those 30, 40, 50 in our larger programs, you know, 200, 300 young people who start, that's kind of the cohort. But that doesn't work for young people who are coming out of correctional institutions. It's hard to predict unless you're like dreams uh, and you know when the release dates are. It's hard to know when they're going to re be released. Some programs have vans and they have the dates and they can show up and pick up young people, but others don't. Uh, and so the Youth Build program at its best when serving this population is adjusted so that the model is very flexible so that there's open enrollment. And what that's meant is that Youth Build programs have to think about how to engage young people who enroll in October or November when some people started in September, right? So they have to think about how to build community, how to have them acclimate to the program and really feel a part of that full group. The other piece about flexible programming is that most youth build programs have sort of a formula for how they think about education and employment and skill training and leadership development and community service. And so the day is kind of mapped out. Again, we need adjustments for young people who are going to engage in the justice system, especially young people who are still under supervision. So if you have to report out to a PO, to a probation officer, if you've got to go in for a drug test, the standard day does not work for you and your day needs to be customized to meet your needs. It also means that your length of stay in a youth build program might be a little longer because you're not there at a youth build program every day, all day. So flexible programming has been very important. We all know how important it is to have a loving, caring adult in your life as a young person. It, I think it's probably important to have a loving, caring adult in your life as an adult, right? But as a young person sort of going through this sort of maturation process, uh, that element of mentoring is very important. And whether it is formal mentoring, like the kinds of mentoring guidelines that have been established by Youth Bill's National Mentoring Alliance in keeping with the Department of Justice's guidelines, or whether it is something that's more relaxed, there is a, an adult who cares about that young person who's able to help navigate them through some of the more challenging moments that they'll experience. Alternative career tracks, we've talked about the way youth build programs have evolved, but you know that this is even more important for young people who may not have access to the same kinds of jobs that their non-adjudicated peers have access to. Financial services, healthcare, working with young people, those jobs are all going to be very difficult. So looking at alternative career tracks uh, is important. And thank goodness, construction, the building trades, and then a whole host of opportunities, even in healthcare, if it's the right kind of job, are very open uh, to young people who are coming in uh, with a justice involvement. Uh, crime and violence prevention has been really important in establishing community relationships with law enforcement. So youth build programs are having their young people, not their staff, but their young people take the leadership role in reaching out to law enforcement or to other members of the justice community to engage in community building activities together. It could be a neighborhood night out, it could be a can drive, it could be a service activity in the community, uh, but bridging that gap has been important um, in our programs. And then state advocacy, many youth build programs are diversion programs. Uh, but not all, so advocacy at the state level to position youth build uh, as an option for diversion, diversion has been important. Some of the lessons learned on this work uh, really connect tightly to partnerships, to the right staffing, and also to having youth voice. So, so excited to hear Dr. Lasante talk about that piece. Uh, the right partnerships, so having partnerships with the juvenile justice system, whether it is for referrals or honestly, just to have your program be the trusted program in the community is very important, right? There are lots of programs, none of them are in this room, but there are lots of programs who promise to provide services and then don't deliver. 
and your partners in the justice community then know who those programs are and they don't want to send their young people to those programs if they're a probation officer. They don't want to send the programs there because those young people there and then get negative backlash from uh, parents or grandparents or teachers. So having a good relationship with your justice community is important. Uh, the same applies for community organizations as well as employer partnerships. Community organizations allow you to expand your service delivery, right? You do not have to be all things to all people, something that we, are, we learn in difficult ways sometimes in the youth build model because it is so comprehensive, but community partnerships are, are very important and the same with employer partnerships. Uh, if that employer, if that company trusts you, if they trust the integrity of your program, then your ability to move someone into employment in that company who has engagement with the justice system gets a lot easier. And that's about building relationships even when you're not looking for a placement, even when you don't need anything, uh, but just building a relationship with that particular uh, employer. And then uh, reentry and behavioral staff, and I'm glad to talk a little more about this um, later, uh, but it's important to staff the program appropriately. So we know sometimes we get a grant and it's a lot of money and we get excited. And then the funder says, you must have these positions in place. And then we sort of get creative and we think about, well, I need to hire one FTE, but why don't I use this grant and pay for 0.5 of that person? And then I'll diversify my funding. I'll have them do a few other things. And that works in a lot of ways. But often for youth build programs, what we found is if they didn't have dedicated staff around reentry, the program suffered and young people suffered. They didn't get the services that they need. They didn't get the case management they needed. The partnership with juvenile justice uh, partners suffered because that person was not focused. They were a reentry coordinator in one moment and they were doing placement later or they were doing data entry. So really just taking the step back and staffing the way it needs to be staffed. That goes doubly so for behavioral health staff, uh, understanding what your young people need, what their mental and emotional challenges are, and either staffing at your program or making sure you have the right partnership uh, to be able to refer your young people. And that partnership means the person, if you can get them to, needs to actually come to your facility and offer those services, right? Every time you refer a young person out the door, if they trust you, but they don't know Ms. Johnson down the street, you lose them. And they never come back and they never get that service. So if we can get Ms. Johnson to come into your facility and provide that and you are you know, co-signing her, right? She is the person, I trust her, so you should trust her. That goes a long way in terms of uh, helping young people address behavioral health needs that we know will be a barrier to their long-term success moving forward. And then having a formal process for youth input. Uh, in the Youth Build model, it's very important for us to elevate youth voice uh, on our criminal justice work and our, our work writ large. It's been important for us to what works at a youth bill program and what does not. Uh, and we also use peer-to-peer -peer youth groups as a way for young people to support each other in their personal and professional development. Uh, so I, I would say our, our key learnings and things I would want you to hold on to are really thinking about customizing and having a flexible model, um, really paying attention to behavioral, behavioral health and thinking about implementing trauma-informed care and don't feel like you have to do the whole thing yourself. Expand your service uh, menu by partnering with people, with organizations that you trust uh, and staff appropriately, and then customize service delivery. Don't give a young person, have them participate in a program design that does not meet their needs. It will damage your credibility. They won't get what they need, but if you do the opposite and you really standardize for what young people who have been involved in the juvenile justice system need, everybody wins, right? Your doors stay open, you can serve more young people, uh, and, and they go on into post-secondary education or employment. So I will stop there and see if there are questions.
who are also criminally justice engaged and very eager to be doing something above and beyond the role they play in the schools and employment, but might be challenged by a second set of circumstances other than those criminal justice engagement, and what does that look like for you? Yeah. yeah, thank you, Cynthia. So there are a few different things happening, right? There, you know, we're, we're now talking about hundreds and hundreds of programs who are customizing the work in the ways that meet the needs of their young people and work in their community. So a few different things happen. Uh, some at their height are actually hiring staff who work inside the facility and that person is a part of the team and so built into the service delivery, built into the day is time with a mental, mental health care provider who can meet those needs. And every young person in a youth build program, regardless you know, as to whether they're just as involved or not, has an individualized service plan, right? So there is something laid out that talks through what they need in terms of education, what they need in terms of career development, and what they need in terms of social and emotional support. And that's a living document that gets adjusted. If the person is on staff, if that staff person exists at the Youth Bill Program, it's a lot easier, everything is integrated. And Youth Bill Program's case conference. So they come together every couple of days in a week and sit down and walk case by case through every young person that's enrolled in that program and talk about service delivery and needs. Uh, and then adjustments are made based on the needs of that particular young person. So everybody might have a day that's 50% education and 40% employment and 10% uh, leadership development. But then there are going to be some adjustments to that in order to address the particular needs of young people who are facing behavioral health challenges. Uh, maybe at the opposite end of the spectrum is that the piece is partnered out. Um, and when it is partnered out, again, best done if that staff is co-located. Uh, and, and then typically a youth build program will have its own data collection system, its own case notes system, and then there has to be some agreement, whether it's a articulation agreement or a memorandum of understanding about what information gets shared and how it gets shared. Uh, but again, the programs that do that the best are programs that vet that partner first to make sure that there is uh, commonality around mission, around how you think about young people, around service delivery, right? So we, we're kind of getting ready to get married. So we have to date a little bit first and make sure we, we, like we have the same long-term goals in mind. Are we working towards the same things? Do we have the same values? Uh, and unless there are barriers on the program around funding, then a youth build program can customize services for each individual any way they want. Sometimes there's funding that says every young person must do this, and there's usually still a little wiggle room for being able to customize what those services look like. Uh, but we want to make sure that if a young person is graduating, they're, uh, is completing the program, they're leaving with a secondary ed credential, they're leaving with employment opportunities, or going on to post-secondary. But someone may come in and have behavioral health care challenges and already have a secondary ed credential. And in that case, they don't need to do that component of the program. They can focus on skills, they can focus on getting healthy, they can focus on developing solid relationships. Uh, so, so I would say the, the way that that happens is really around very sharp customization for each individual young person in the model. Oh. All right, okay. I have uh, two two questions. Um, the first question is probably kind of like a softball. Um, we recently at the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice have partnered with Youth Build and we are having unbelievable success in that partnership. We're trying to, we would love to expand it to all of our facilities. We've started it in just two at this point. So the question is, is there plan to expand Youth Build? You know, is that part of the vision of Youth Build to, to move into more um, deep end juvenile justice, to move into more communities? That's one question. Well, there better be, or I have a job yeah. detention <laughs> problem. <laughs> the person who leads the criminal justice work. Uh, yes, I mean, Youth Build programs have been serving young people who are court involved. The shift that has happened over the last, I'd say, 10 or so years is that we're really trying to ask programs uh, to be much more intentional. And that's how we make our way to a criminal justice model, to understanding what those young people need and how that's different, again, from their uh, peers who are not court involved. Uh, we have 
uh, two mechanisms for expanding youth build. One is that Youth Build USA as a national intermedi intermediary receives support, right? And then we subgrant to our affiliates, those 200 some odd programs. The other is that there is a Youth Build federal appropriation that sits with the United States Department of Labor and Youth Build grows in that way as well. There are many programs that are funded either by us or by the Department of Labor who are co-located inside correctional facilities, uh, who are doing work behind the walls, but they're community-based. Uh, the best way, I, I'm softball back to you, right? Um, and I'm glad that you're working with the Youth Build Program, but the best way to do that is really to engage with the national office because it allows us to lift up and support programs on the ground. The programs on the ground are the ones that are doing the work, uh, but we are often better, better positioned to bring a different level of resources to the table. What has been your experience with uh, youth that sometimes mess up with employers and your relationship with those employers continuing on? Yeah, and what, what do you do with to, to, to mend those kind of issues? Yeah. Usually there's a lot of yelling and screaming behind closed doors. Oh, no, I can't believe that happened. And then the staff kind of get it together and collect themselves. You have to do damage control. Right? This is why it's really important to build a relationship with the employer when you're not asking for anything. If the only time you go and talk to an employer is when you have the pressure of having 30 young people who need to get jobs, you have a problem. Right? Don't go dating when you're desperate. You have to actually build the relationship aside from the moment of need. Uh, and I, I think for youth build programs and, and youth serving programs in general, there are a few things we have to do. One is we have to be able to separate in conversations with the business community our who our stakeholders are. Right? So when we are talking to the business community, we have to be able to talk about what they need and to understand what their needs are and how we can address them. And that's very different from saying, I have young people, you have a social responsibility, you should hire them, right? So the message has to be different, the strategy has to be very different. Um, and then we have to, sometimes we have to sit out a couple of rounds and then we have to be selective, honestly, about then who the next referrals are for that position. Some people think that that's creaming, but in the world that we all live in, not too sure we're creaming, right? We, I mean, we're all working with opportunity youth who all have a lot of barriers. So. Uh, just a lot of damage control, and anytime you can have a champion, another employer with whom you have a solid relationship who can say, yeah, we had a couple of moments like that too, but guess what? They got it together. They figured it out. We sat down. We communicated better. Anytime you can have someone else from the business community speak on your behalf, that makes your damage control uh, a lot easier. Hi, this question is uh, principally for Tim, but certainly any of you, um, if you want to uh, chime in on it. Um, one of the things that I heard a lot during my time working in New York City was that what works for New York City probably doesn't work elsewhere and vice versa. And, and so obviously, Tim, you were bringing in um, a lot of what New York City has done to improve services um, and connect uh, youth to uh, education after confinement. But in your many years of experience, I know you've been a lot of places across the country looking at best practices. Can you speak to something that you have seen um, that has been successfully transferred from elsewhere to New York City or vice versa, or something you tried to bring to New York City and it just didn't work? And the last piece of that is, what advice would you give to smaller jurisdictions about the kinds of things <coughs> at, at the most basic level that they can do? One thing that we really learned a lot from was in this blended learning, which is really <coughs> pretty new, but very exciting for us. That's again, uh, using online courses, blended with uh, teacher instruction. And San Diego was way ahead of us, uh, years ahead of us. So what we did was um, we set up a conference call with their uh, tech people, first of all, to work out all the security things, because again, we didn't have any of this. So that's a, one thing that we really learned. Then we, then we <coughs> We learned from their mistakes. Uh, one was professional development. We in education tend to roll out initiatives without giving training to teachers and just kind of uh, do it very quickly. We learned that from, uh, from San Diego. As I've been around, uh, I, I, I really focus in on the teaching, the instruction, and um, 
to tell you the truth, I didn't see a whole lot of exciting instruction as I, I went around. I saw a lot of good counseling and a lot of good CTE stuff, but as far as academic, and that's why I think blended learning is, is really one of the big answers used in technology. So that's, that's a couple of things that we've picked up from other jurisdictions. Do we have time for any more or should we wrap? All right, great. Well, um, actually, I guess real quick, real quick, I'm gonna put up uh, contact information here. Thank you so much um, to our uh, presenters. A uh, big round of applause for Monica Zita-Martin and Timothy Asante. Thank you for joining us. For folks who had questions that you may not have been able to get to, there is contact information here. We're all happy to field any additional questions that come in and thank you all for joining us.